Welcome to the last and hopefully one of the best sessions of the 2024 Iowa Ideas Conference. Today we'll be talking with a great panel about the rise of artificial intelligence in higher education. My name is Erin Jordan. I'm a former investigative reporter with the Gazette, but this fall I started teaching in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications at the University of Iowa. I can attest personally that use of AI by students is something being talked about a lot by university faculty. Uh, I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel. The audience may submit questions for the panel through the Whova app, and I'll plan to um, enter those into our conversation as we go along rather than saving them until the end. So I'd like to start us off by asking our three panelists to introduce themselves and their connection to the topic of AI in higher education. Vicki, would you like to start? Uh, certainly. My name is Vicki Malloy. I work at the University of Iowa in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Technology. Um, as far as AI goes, I have been one of the co-facilitators here at Iowa for our faculty AI interest group for the past couple of years. And um, we just on September 27th successfully hosted our first AI at IA Day uh, for innovative and, and academic applications of AI. Great. Patrick? Yes, uh, my name is Patrick Fan. I'm a Henry Tippy Chair Professor at Tippy College of Business, University of Iowa. And I've been doing research in AI and in business applications for the last 25 years or so. I also teach my students how to use AI, leverage AI for their daily work. Great, thank you. And Chris? So my name is Chris Snyder. I'm an Associate Professor at Drake University in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. My, I'm just always interested in new technology and how we can get that in the hands of our students and how they can think about how that affects the communications world that they're in. So I uh, just have always kind of taught this, this idea. So when AI came along and, and when we realized it's more than just text, there's a lot of other tools with it, uh, just was something we wanted to include. I actually started a company called Innovation Profs with the head of Drake's AI department where, you know, we focus on making sure that People in the community have the knowledge they need to make decisions to use or not use these generative AI tools as they come out. So we do do workshops and training, other stuff like that. That's great. So artificial intelligence has played a role in higher education for decades, uh, just even from basic features like spell check and internet searches, uh, transcription services more recently. Um, Patrick, you've been studying AI and its use in education and business for a long time. Um, can you tell us more about how the release of generative AI programs such as, such as ChatGPT really kind of shook up the apple cart? Yes. Um, you know, if you look at the histories of the AI development, uh, AI was first, uh, you know, coined. And then uh, um, we have this term in the 1950s. So ever since this AI um, was, this field was established, and then the researchers in computer science, in mathematics optimization, and even uh, in this uh, AI field has been trying to develop new technologies, you know, over the last, uh, you know, uh, four or five decades. Um, you know, and that over the years, if you look at the major breakthroughs, we have expert systems and we have deep learning. And then recently we have this new generative AI uh, re revolution. And uh, this generative AI essentially wants, uh, the reason why this generative AI is being invented is because uh, we have this mature development in the cloud computing, and then also machine learning, as well as this uh, uh, very fast, you know, uh, computing power that we can potentially leverage on. And that this this enables the deep learning to uh, come into the main uh, major play, major stage, and then people has been using the thing called deep learning, which is a type of neural network, try to mimic the human brains to work, to think, to reason. So because of that, you know, um, the generative AI technologies, you know, now, uh, especially you know uh, the the ones like ChatGPT, Gemini from Google, and uh, um, you know um, Anthropic, you know, we have this thing called Cloudy. All of these new tools has starting to come into play and then people, industries has been trying to embrace them and to leverage them for a variety of uh, you know, creative activities. 
such as you know text generation, code generation, video generation, and also even like music generation. So um, you know, th this has really uh, starting to take off, and then uh, you 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 also see uh, pretty much all the major companies are starting to embrace this generative AI and starting to you know studying the impact of generative AI on their business. You know, shall we? For example, launching some new, you know, use cases, you know, so we, you know, maybe leverage this AI, maybe to, uh, you know, automate or, you know, to, uh, you know, help us to improve the productivity of the employees, things like that. So, you know, it's really uh, fascinating to see that, that uh, you know, this general AI, as you said, has really, you know, touching the field for pretty much everybody. Well, and on the... Um academic front, I don't know if just the availability, the ease of access of tapping into these programs, if students have become more aware of it, or if that's um, also just a new part of the uh, scenarios that students are aware these programs are out there and they're free. Is, would you say that's true, Patrick? Yes. So if you, if I ask my student, for example, two years ago, and I ask them, how many of you guys have used ChatGPT? Nobody. Okay. Zero people. But if I ask them today, you know, like this semester, when I ask my student, you know, how many of you guys have used ChatGPT? Everybody raised their hands. So you, you can see that, you know, right now, everybody is aware there's such a tools available. And also these tools are available because, you know, you know, the companies like Microsoft, Google, and also OpenAI have been making these tools for free, you know? So like, for example, Microsoft had this thing called Copilot. You know, right now, this, this platform is entirely is freely available to University of Iowa faculty and students and, and students. Vicky, you want to say something about it? Yeah. I will say that it is not free to the university, that the university oh, oh, is sorry. providing it to our students and staff. And also, right. I wanted to say good job on creating such a supportive environment so that your students are honestly telling you when they're using their access to these large language models, because sometimes students feel afraid that they will be accused of academic in integrity violations if they even say that they looked at an AI. So sorry for interrupting. Good points. So Chris, I wanted to ask you, how has your approach to teaching changed now that students can just easily access AI to answer quiz questions or to write an essay? Yeah, so it's had to change, right? And so, you know, I kind of view my, you know, I think about my my role here, right? So I'm I'm teaching in a professional school and I'm trying to get these students ready to go out and work in an ever-changing world. So I believe that, I mean, I teach a lot of first-year students. When these students graduate in 2028, nobody's going to hire them to do jobs that AI can do, right? So, so I believe I need to be upfront with AI, including AI in my classes, uh, and making sure they understand, you know, how to use these tools. The the big win I see in using AI in the you know quote unquote real world is is this idea of you got human expertise plus AI to bring that together. Um, and the problem is our students don't have that expertise yet, right? They're they're not experts in these subjects yet. And so I try to convince them we're going to use AI, but first you need to prove that you have expertise in this area. You can do this on your own. Then we'll learn how we can, you know, bring in AI to enhance what you do and 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 hopefully do it better or do it faster or more efficiently. Um, but it, my big thing is I need these students to show in some way that they have this expertise first, right? And that might mean that they need to do something in front of me now that they would do on their own and turn into me before, right? That might mean we we do we write things out by by hand now instead of doing it you know a different way. Or or I put things in my assignments that I know that AI won't get quite right. So they do need to do some some work on their own to, to get that right. But I think you know we've, we've got to know what these tools are, know what they can do, and you know, stay ahead of the students, which is an, an impossible game for us to play, right? To to stay ahead of what the the students know and what they're able to do. I'd like to ask each of you to share uh, about an innovative way you've seen or AI used in the classroom, either something you've tried yourself or something you've heard about happening at your institution. Vicki, do you want to start? I know you probably hear about a lot of these. I do hear a lot about, oh, uh, there's some really amazing things going on um, in a tip of the hat to our Tippy College of Business. We've got an instructor in the MBA program who 
is offering students the opportunity. Uh, it is not required, but it is available. She has custom built a GPT that will take a student's transcripts from a breakout room and they have a project together and then they run their transcript through this GPT to give them feedback on their team cohesiveness and their processes. It's really fabulous. So students, some students are reporting that they are able to take feedback better from a computer. They feel that it is less biased than a human, which I think is very interesting. But also what a great way to make feedback available on scale because an instructor can't visit a breakout room for each breakout room for the entire class. Great idea. Chris or Patrick? So I'll share uh, because, you know, I teach, uh, you know, two separate courses at the University of Iowa, primarily for the graduate level students. And one of them is called social analytics, where we teach students how to analyze social media data mostly. And it's a, uh, This is the programming related course and the student gonna use Python as a programming language to analyze the social data. And in that course, I basically give the students like all the homeworks. And then when I give them the homeworks, I'm gonna ask the student to submit two versions of the homeworks. One version is basically done by themselves, you know, that they have to do that first. And then another version is the one they're gonna basically using the chat GBT or co-pilot as a tool to help them, as AI tool, gen AI tool to help them. And then the student also need to summarize and compare like how much benefit they have gained by using these AI tools. You know, and in the end, everybody basically, you know, think very positively about their overall experience. And they feel like the AI tools that they use, you know, really help them a lot in terms of improving uh, their productivity. And then, now granted that uh, the code they produce may not always work, and then they, they have to do a little bit debugging, but, you know, uh, the knowledge they learned, you know, from the course and also the, the, um, the, the template they produce by this AI tools really help them to speed up things. And then they gain, you know, almost like 40% on, on, in terms of coding, you know, uh, productivity time. So because of that, you know, I feel like, you know, the students really see the value down the road when they go to the professional world. And then they can see that, you know, how this AI tools can potentially help them, you know, in, in, in their daily work. And I, I, when I teach another course on data, uh, database management, and we, we do a lot of coding uh, using the language called a SQL, which is a structured query language uh, that for students to learn how to manage database, you know, the, the data in a data database. And that SQL programming is also uh, heavily, heavily, you know, um, being used right now by the industry. And, uh, and the generative AI tools can be a great helper and tutor uh, to teach students how to do this kind of SQL uh, programming. So for my, you know, for this course, I also, for the last homework, and I ask my student, you know, hey, you know, I do need you to submit two versions, one by yourself, one by the, um, by these AI tools, with AI tools for help. And then I'm waiting to see, I have not finished the uh, homework grading yet, but I'm waiting to see how the student gonna respond, you know, but so far, uh, everybody seems like very positive through the interactions I had with them. That's great, Chris. So, you know, when, when, when we have students do something in our classes, we there's a reason that we're having them do those things, right? So, so we know that the students may not always realize that, um, but we have things we want them to learn from things from that project or that assignment or that you know group getting together. And so, I try to think about: uh, Are there things that aren't necessarily the learning outcomes from this assignment that they could use AI to do better? So, I'll give you like a super simple example. Here is I teach a class with with first year students and I do this exercise where my outcome is I want them to meet each other because they're gonna be taking the same classes together for the next four years. They're all School of Journalism students, right? So the outcome that I want is that they meet each other and get to know each other. And so I have them you know, get together, talk about things they have in common, figure out some things they all have in common, and then come up with a, a name for their group based on the things they have in common, right? So they've done this for a long time. And what I found is these college students aren't good at suddenly brainstorming name ideas with people they don't know that they just met and don't want to be super, you know, creative or funny or different in front of. And so now I just say, do the other things. So you meet each other. Now go to chat GPT and type in the things you have in common and ask it for 20 
possible group names for, for your group, right? And so now instead of having to come up with ideas, they're rejecting ideas or saying ones they like, and they're kind of doing this thing together. So, so to me, it enhances the outcome I want of them to meet each other and get to know each other better and doesn't step on the toes of, of any outcomes that I, you know, that they need to get from that assignment. So that's my approach. So same thing with my web design class right now. My students have an assignment due at 3 p.m. today where they can prove to me that they can write a blog post that's formatted for the web, get it posted on their website, find a link to it, turn that link in. It's all about those last things. It's nothing about their ability to write a blog post. So I say, let AI write the blog post if you want, because I'm looking that you can do these, these other things, right? So the outcome of that is not being able to write. So that's my approach is what are the outcomes of this? And then how can we use AI to uh, maybe... You know, some students would stress out about that blog post, right? But it's like you're stressing out about something that isn't even part of what we're we're trying to do here. So AI can step in and, and take the place of that. That's interesting. So earlier this week, uh, Jeffrey Hinton won the Nobel Prize for Physics for helping create uh, generative AI, some of the uh, basics behind that. Uh, he quit his job with Google in 2023 because of concerns there were not adequate controls over the programs and their development and use. He said he feared there would be, quote, unintended and harmful consequences, um, in, in unquote, some of the things he mentioned, misinformation, job displacement, and even threats to humanity at large. I wanted to ask the panel this serious question, you know, given these concerns by the people who have uh, created these programs, isn't there an argument for caution in terms of using these products in higher education? I think so. Uh, let me comment first, and then maybe we can, Chris, you can add on. Um, so uh, one of the things that you probably hear, as, as Hinton mentioned, you know, the safety, uh, the ethics, the privacy, and all of that are going to become an issue. And uh, however, uh, it just depends on what's the user scenario, what's the use case is really about. Like, for example, when we try to, uh, you know, in the higher education settings, when we try to teach students, like, in terms of coding, you know, and coding is, is not considered like, you know, uh, a mission critical activity. And uh, so we are basically, you know, let, ask the student basically to leverage the AI tools to help them to do the, the things that can potentially increase their productivity. So from that angle, I do not see a major concern on that. But uh, on the other hand, if you think about um, the, the content where, you know, feed into these generative AI tools. Like for example, all these codings, all these discussions, where do they get the data from? They, they get the data from this online, you know, uh, website and uh, discussion forums, or, you know, um, well, website like, you know, the stack, you know, stack overflow, things like that. So all of these online websites, for example, the user is gonna own the content, you know, that they created essentially. So the generative AI tool essentially is just leverage this content, crawl this content, and then build a models on top of that, and then try to basically come up with a commercial product that people can use. So there, there are all kinds of like a discussion, talk about like ownership, of the content, who owns what, right? Artists, for example, produce the images, they put them on the website and then got to be taken advantage by these uh, uh, AI companies for training, you know, uh, learning purposes. So uh, that's uh, one major issue. And then of course, you know, the other issues like, you know, you know, if you use this AI to produce a content and then who's going to be the ones going to be responsible Right, it's gonna be you, the student, gonna be responsible for whatever you said through this content, or it's gonna be the AI company gonna be the ones to be to be blamed for, you know. And uh, so I always tell my student, I said, you know, when you submit your homework, okay, you are the one has to basically approve the product from the AI tools, and you are the one gonna be responsible for whatever you're gonna deliver, and then I'm gonna grade based on the the final product, you know, um, whatever you submitted. And then you have, you are the one essentially gonna be the ones take the penalty if you submit something wrong. So uh, from that perspective, you know, I feel like, you know, um, we have to be more like a responsibility to use this AI products. And we also need to know uh, what's the consequence it could be, all right? And if this is like, for example, you use AI for medical diagnosis, for example, then obviously you have to be very, very cautious in terms of how do you come up with the, the conclusions? Do you know how to interpret the result from this AI, you know, tools, for example? 
you know, and that's like they're that's going to uh, bring on all kinds of ethical and uh, moral questions. And then, and then in the end of the day, you know, the doctors, the providers, you have to be the ones going to be, you know, uh, you know, sign off on this kind of output. So for higher education, generally speaking, um, I you know depends on the content essentially. You know, uh, if you talk about creative writing, yes, there there could be some potential. Uh, safety uh, and other things, you know, uh, that it could be made up on that. Vicky and Chris, I'll leave you guys to you guys to add more. Vicky, go ahead. Okay. Um, there are some people that are really thinking deeply about the ethics of AI in education, and I am very glad for that. Uh, some of the topics that they are specifically looking at, as opposed to a broader AI ethics include things like the impact of students and the role of teachers in this in this world where AI is available. Um, but one of the interesting things that our education organizations are looking at are the access, the accessibility of these tools. Because while you did say at the beginning that these tools are for free on the internet, the tools that are for free are of a lesser quality than the ones that you can subscribe to. So that is an access issue uh, that, I mean, in Iowa, we have to be aware that there is a digital divide, that some people do not have access to the high-speed internet that makes these tools so effective. Um, another thing is the transparency and the explainability that is not present in AI, uh, because AI is very much a black box. We have taught the computers to program themselves, but we need to be able to see how they came to their conclusions and, and are they coming to these conclusions consistently? As Patrick said about medical AI, these are, these are very effective. A medical AI never has a bad day. So sometimes an AI is the resource that you want to use. However, you have to understand that it has been trained very specifically and very thoroughly before you can trust it. You should always have that human perspective on the output. Yeah, that's great. You guys, you know, said great things, right? And I think, you know, my real interest is is social media, and right. So we've seen social media get everything wrong, right? With never being regulated, no rules, and it's become a disaster, right? So, oh, this is great. I can find, you know, my friend from when I was in fourth grade who I haven't talked to in in, in you know ten years, but then we see the the effects this has on on children down the road in this so so i think that we need we need regulation in the ai field to make sure that we're thinking about all these these things that have you know already come up here yeah you know chris you had mentioned just some ways that um you might tweak assignments um, and tests to kind of reduce the likelihood that students are out <clears throat> outsourcing those critical like learning moments um you know, uh, you had mentioned just the idea of like having them have to do a task in front of you or in front of the class versus, um, you know, just online or just in a written form. Um, I don't know if there if you've had success with that, if you think that's kind of, you know, doing what you want, like keeping the students focus on the learning objectives you have, or if you feel like it's still pretty easy to kind of get around those strategies. Yeah, so my classes were were pretty hands on in class doing things together, and so I I mean I'm right there looking at their screen while they do stuff, right? So I think so I think I have the, this sort of advantage. Um, but I do have a, an online class going right now where you start thinking, you know, oh that that could have just been done by by AI. I have no idea, right? Because I don't know, I don't see that they're reading the book. I don't you know have that that interaction. So you know I feel like. In my in-person classes, I've got it right, but where I still need some some work is in my online classes to to really think through these assignments. You know, in our online classes, we sort of create them and have to be completely done before the semester starts and, and rolled out, and so we don't can't adapt as as quickly. But you know, that's that's my blind spot right now is the, those online classes. Um, but I think the in-person classes works. But but say to the same token is when someone misses class. And they're not there for what we did in class. That's a pretty easy way for them to just use some some AI to to do this for them. And so, you know, that's why I need to think to about you know. And I do think about like, okay, you miss class, 
let's get together here and let's go over this together, right? So I want to make sure that I'm going over it with them and not just sort of letting them have that, uh, you know, just the pull of, of you know, chat GPT. I, at the end of the semester last year, one quick example, I, you know, would have to have Zoom meetings with students to go over some some like last minute assignments that they were, were working on. And every time a student went to share their screen with me, Chat GBT is right there as a tab open, right? So, so every single time. So, I mean, I know they're they're using it for something, uh, but we gotta, you know, yeah, just think through how we're smart about our assignments and how we we truly force them to show they've learned what we need them to learn. Wow, Vicky, you interact with a lot of faculty in all different programs at the University of Iowa. Are you seeing some faculty returning to maybe um, older technology models, you know, pen and paper tests or, you know, blue books, things like that, more in-class presentations? What are you seeing on campus? Um, definitely a rise of multimodal in-class presentations and graphic, uh, interesting and at transparent assignments. Um, a lot of authentic assignments to interact with people. Perhaps they're doing more interviews, which you can't get from an AI. Um, also some really interesting assignments that integrate AI, like um, a, a history assignment where they generated a, an AI timeline, and then they examined it very quickly for perspectives and what was missing. So. Uh, I've seen a lot of interesting things, but we don't necessarily want a return to the blue book. Uh, don't want a return to handwriting because of accessibility issues. Sometimes the handwriting uh, assignments are, are an issue for some of our students. Okay. Um, and Patrick, I don't know, it sounds like you are, you're in a mode of just really embracing this. Do you feel like others in Tippy feel the same way as you? Do you feel like you're having conversations with more of your colleagues just about how you're doing what you do and whether they want to go that direction or like return to maybe a more old fashioned mode? So I think um, in Tippy, we are probably one of the first few business schools in the country that uh, studying to uh, study this and then also have a policy in place that it can encourage all faculty members within TB College, you know, try to embrace AI in their classroom teaching. So uh, we even have a task force and we also share the uh, best practices and the experiences from the instructors in terms of how they can better use the AI for learning, for teaching, for homeworks, and also for assessment as well. So I think everybody is on board pretty much. And uh, our dean, our associate deans are very supportive for this kind of uh, initiatives. In terms of the assessment, and I think it's up to the individual instructors to decide what's the best way for assessment. Like for me, as example, you know, I think I agree with Wiki, you know, I mean, in terms of assessment, you know, we don't have to always go back to the traditional way. You know, you, you can, for example, for me, I do this thing called hybrid. You know, it just depends on what you are trying to do, you know. And uh, so I I use the, um, you know, paper-based kind of the exam, for example, right? And to do this kind of a, a traditional way of assessment. But then I also have the coding side, you know, which I allow them to use AI, I allow them to using the, uh, you know, the uh, any of the tools, you know, open notes. And you can, as long as you can get things accomplished, you know, that serve the purpose. So I think uh, we just need to uh, be creative from the instructor uh, instructor perspective. Know that, you know, there's uh, uh, people could use AI, for example, for, for their, you know, uh, generation of the content. But then at the same time, you also need to understand, you know, what are the things that you are trying to assess, you know, from the student learning perspective. For certain things, you could uh, uh, assess them using the traditional way. But for other things, you know, you might have to just embrace AI, let the AI play the roles in this, and then give them like a limited amount of time. You know, they, they may use AI tools, but that will take a longer time. So it's a very short window. And then most of the time, they have to basically focus on their own, and then they have to work on that, you know, with this short time window. That's that's interesting. I like that idea. Um, so a question from the audience uh, it says, from the perspective of a college journalism teacher and a concern about AI in compiling a written news story, um, kind of related to showing that expertise that Chris mentioned, 
So if students uh, make a factual error in the story that they produce, you know, which students are going to make errors, that's a part of all, all as we learn. Um, but then these a these errors could be part of this reservoir of information that AI is using as training material. Um, do you see, you know, kind of tr problems with that? Is is that, um, you know, going to, uh, I mean, I guess is... How does that affect, you know, what material is out there for these AI programs? I don't know, Chris, well, if you want to take that one or others. You know, I mean, just add to the other, you know, non-factual information that these these LLMs are trained on, right? So, 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 I mean, they're trained on the internet. The internet has plenty of things that are wrong, right? Google has a deal with Reddit. Reddit is not going to be, you know, the place you go to get everything to be perfectly factual, right? And so... You know, I still don't rely on using Chat GBT, Gemini, Copilot, these tools to get an answer where the where the answer needs to be true or false, right? I use it when the when the is this a good idea or a bad idea, or can I take 80% of these ideas and and work with them and I bring in the other 20%, right? So to me, it's still not a a, a fact engine that that I'm that I'm trying to get, right? And and so so yeah, so and it's not a huge concern to me that, you know, that information is going into the, the machines, if that's what the question is. So, and you know, I mean, just, and, in, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. Sorry, Aaron. You know, so basically, you know, if you look at this question, you know, you know, think about the AI uh, evolution. The general AI has gone through this stages of development. If you talk about like, for example, two years ago, if you use ChatGPT, and then there's a lot of thing called a hallucination where they made up, make up things. You know, and that's where, you know, you see, oh, this is this is all made up. This is not a factual, you know, this is wrong, you know. But uh, nowadays, uh, this journey AI tools has come to a stage where they, they, they are aware that factual checking is critical. They cannot just do this thing called hallucinations. So because of that, you know, they have been incorporating some new technologies, new techniques, like for example, RAG technology is called retrieval augmented generation, which means they're going to search the content first, make sure they, they have the sources of the content, and then they bring, bring in those content through these AI engines, and then they produce the content for these articles. So if you look at, uh, for example, the co-pilot, which leverages, you know, you know, generate AI technology from OpenAI, they produce kind of new summaries. They can produce it like a journal articles or whatever. You know, they are very factual. They have the sources cited. They tell you specifically where this thing coming from. To me, as a journalist, if you are learning on that, you, you, you can go there, do the factor checking yourself, make sure everything has been done. Then I think you can easily, easily see whether there's anything basically is wrong or, you know, made up. Then you can just make the corrections. To me, it's a good thing to do. But I think the AI tools has been going through the stages of uh, uh, development. I think now is coming to a stage where this kind of hallucination may not be as bad as before. Just getting to the training materials that that these programs require, um, you know, often you have to provide provide them with a prompt or a question that you're asking, and that might include feeding information into the programs. Sometimes that material might be copyrighted or developed by a professor for a class. Um, what are the security or copyright risks of using these programs in an academic setting? Um, well, there is that is one of the reasons that we are encouraging people to take advantage of Microsoft Copilot because here at Iowa we have an agreement with Copilot that they are not using our data to train future models. Um, and there are other large language models that do this. Anthropics Claude has that in their privacy terms, but it's so important to understand to click on that terms and conditions link and see who is in, in charge of your output. I mean, it was generated by a computer. It was prompted by you. So that cloudy, fuzzy notion of ownership is, is one of the issues today. Um, but also, when you are putting data into these cloud systems, you need to make sure that you are not feeding the machine anything sensitive or private. And that's something very important to keep in mind. 
and I, uh, okay. you know, when I teach the courses, for example, I, um, you know, ours is more like a programming related, which is not that bad. But I always, always, you know, give students the advice, you know, telling them you have to be very, very careful in terms of what kind of data are you going to put into this kind of AI tools. You know, if you look at this, as Vicky mentioned, almost all of these general AI tools, by default, they're going to take your data, take whatever the problem you use, take whatever the output you use, and also your feedback, using that as a way to train, to fine tune their models. This is by default. But Microsoft Copilots, you know, have this thing called enterprise version, as Vicky mentioned, you know, basically respect the, uh, the privacy of the users. So they have this kind of enterprise addition that basically, you know, delete all the data, you know, from the session. They won't even use that data for training uh, their future models. So, you know, I think as long as we are aware what type of tools we are using and also know that the data kind of data that we are using, you know, is very sensitive, then we can be more responsible, you know, using these AI tools. So that's why, you know, we teach the thing called responsible AI usage in our class. We always tell them what is the good, what is the proper way for you to use these type of tools? What kind of data you should upload? What kind of data you should not do? And then for any of the things that require like IRB approval for research, like a patient data or, you know, transaction data, financial institution data, you cannot just upload them you know, directly to these kind of tools because you are going to be, uh, uh, you know, in violation of the federal regulations on that. Okay, just to, you know, reiterate, these companies are trying to make a profit off of this. So they, you know, we're feeding them all this material and they then are developing products based on this material that we share with them and our experience from the internet and, you know, streaming services are people do not read the terms and conditions. People are not um, responsible with that when it comes to, you know, so I guess I feel like that, that uh, we can say, yeah, people should be responsible, but are they? I don't know. Um, so when, if university faculty are trying to, um, well, okay, just kind of speaking back to a different issue in past years, that's also still out there. Um, if faculty were trying to thwart plagiarism, they could use software that would detect passages that have appeared elsewhere. Um, there are similar detectors for AI um, how well do they work and are they recommended for university faculty? I know, Vicki, you've taken that question before. I have. So I can stay off the soapbox for, for just a minute and let Chris and Patrick answer. <laughs> uh, you know, from my standpoint, they're, you know, they're they're wrong a certain percentage of the time. And so to me, they're they're worthless then because who knows the thing I put in, if it's right or it's wrong, right? So I would rather focus my time on making sure my students are, are thinking ethically and making the right decisions for them themselves so that they're going to, you know, not, not use AI in places they're, they're not supposed to use it. But at, at this point, like I've, I've heard that chat GPT has a detector that is supposedly hundred percent accurate, but they will not ever release it to the world because they don't want it to be in the world. But none of these other ones are accurate enough to use. Although I, if, Students use the word, the, these, uh, there are certain words that these tools use more often, like so delve is one of them. So if you start seeing the word delve in stuff students turn in, that's a pretty good clue that, okay, this might might be written by AI. So keep that in mind. I mean, from what I know, uh, and also from our uh, TP college, we, we even share this kind of a uh, um, college-wide policy saying that, hey, uh, we do not use any of this kind of AI detectors in, in our college. Why? There have been studies studies showing that these detectors won't work, you know, and uh, because people can always submit this, you know, uh, the same thing to the chat GPT and ask them to do like multiple times, redo, redo, redo. If you redo five times, none of the tools are going to detect that. Okay. So just because of, you know, all this uh, AI, um, you know, regeneration power, uh, it's just almost impossible from my mind in terms of to detect this uh, content that are produced by the AI. 
and, and also I agree with Chris, you know, I don't feel like, you know, for us as instructor, we want to spend the time trying to detect those kind of things. And instead we should, you know, think about how, what's a better way, you know, to teach the students to use AI and also what's a better way to assess the students on their learning effectiveness. So, uh, you know, do not spend too much time on this AI detector efficiencies because yeah, at the end of the day, it's not going to really worthwhile to pursue. Wiki. <laughs> okay. Don't use them. Don't use them and don't use them because it is going to affect your teaching relationship. But also plagiarism detectors are based on matching. So there is evidence. There is a match. This phrase was found exactly in this other source. And it, then it delivers that match to the instructor and the instructor gets to judge. But with the AI detector, they are going off of an algorithm. They're saying, you know, it is very likely that because of other ways that these these documents have been written and have been found to be, it's a guess. And you should not be judging your students on a guess. Now, what you can do if you find something uh, that perhaps is a questionable, they're talking about delving a lot, or they use in conclusion, or if you've seen a paper that says in the middle of the paper, it says as an AI tool, I cannot guess on this. A student has copied and pasted, but you could have a conversation with your student. You can say, tell me about your research practice. Tell me why you came to this conclusion. What led you to use this phrasing? Um, some people have also built rubrics that emphasize the human voice. Some people use uh, methods in their writing to say your paper must use direct quotes. Uh, AI gets direct quotes wrong a lot because it's again a very probabilistic output. Um, and if an AI generated citation is at the end of the paper, it will not be found. So some people say give me a link to the paper that you are citing. And these are ways, these are some strategies to help. And Vicki, isn't there some evidence showing the AI detectors can also um, key in on people who, who English isn't their first language? Yes, yes. Uh, there's been papers that research that when you learn English, you often find yourselves learning in a formulaic style and that comes out in your writing and that gets flagged. Also, uh, Common Sense Media this summer did a study and they found uh, that black teenagers are twice as likely to have been accused of using AI than white teenagers. And, and that's another reason not to use it. You are, you are enabling this discrimination and this stereotype. And that doesn't mean you don't have those conversations, as you mentioned, you know, talking about your research, how did you get this information? Why did you choose this? But you can do that without accusing. Right. Okay, another question from the audience. Um, this uh, participant says, I love the idea of embracing AI while engaging the results in class regarding accuracy and perspective. Have faculty, either um, you folks who are here, uh, used AI themselves in terms of research, or are you aware of research, I guess, that, that on AI that's going on in Iowa? So for me, uh, you know, I'm doing research in the AI area in general, uh, but at the same time, I also tell my PhD students, the graduate level PhD students, when they do research, for example, they can embrace some of the new AI tools. Some of the AI tools, for example, built, in, uh, built on top of the chat GPT technologies, they can help the student to do, for example, literary review. They can, for example, you give a topic like data mining or AI, they can go outside and then looking for all kinds of databases, pull out these articles, research articles, and then produce this kind of a map or summary of this literature on, on a particular topic. So those type of tools are already out there. And then if you can leverage those tools, that will basically help you to increase your productivity. And I told my student, I said, you go for it, use them. And then, then at the same time, you also want to do your own search to see whether their their comprehensive coverage is re, is indeed comprehensive enough. Have they include all the key literatures? If you saw, for example, they include certain things, not including others, it's your job to include your own literature. 
to come to complement the ones produced by these AI tools. So in, essentially, uh, we are trying to encourage researchers to use these AI tools together with their own expertise. You know, and you have it's going to be hybrid mode no matter what. And we do find that this is a, a very very beneficial, and the students like that. Uh, but you know, we we can. I told them, you know, you cannot, for example just copy paste this entire content from the AI tools into your research paper. You can't do that. Okay, so this is unethical. And they, you know, people can see that. And, uh, and some of the journals even discourage you for you to use this generative AI in terms of writing these articles. So just be careful on those things. You can ask the uh, AI tool to help you to edit, for example, to re-paraphrase maybe a, a few paragraphs. That's okay, you know? And then you have to do some changes on that you know, by yourself but you cannot just let the AI to write the entire article, entire sections of the articles. To me, that's not a good way for you to learn. And you have to learn how to do proper technical writing, you know, as a part of the training process. I have two thoughts on that. Um, and number one is using AI in research can mean a lot of different things because you could use an AI to translate. You could use an AI with your note taking. Um, you can use your AI uh, to, to help you with your writing. Um, these are all different facets of AI. So AI is so big, it could mean a lot of different things. And my other thought is, you should check out the Iowa Initiative for Iowa in Artificial Intelligence. They are an amazing group here at Iowa. A lot of people that are doing some fascinating research using what I consider big AI. They're using uh, AI di um, discernment. They're using AI decisions uh, to investigate medical applications, psychiatry, and education. They're an amazing group of people to just browse their website. Anything you would add on that, Chris, or if not, that's fine too. No, these guys are more in the okay. research world than I am. Okay, so speaking to just kind of the ongoing development of these programs and what they were two year years ago, what they are now, what they'll be two years from going forward, um, what safeguards would you like to see added to AI tools? If suddenly Congress decided to get proactive and um, put some measures in place, what safeguards do you think would be helpful, especially with regard to higher education and use of AI? I don't know if Chris, you want to start with that? That's a good question. Uh, um, you know, I think that, well, you know, my, my, I think my biggest issue here kind of goes back to, to something that, that Vicky said before about just the access to these tools, right? And that's the, the biggest problem I have in education is that, you know, this is very much a, a pay to play area. Yes, there are free tools you can use, but the good stuff costs money. And the fact that we've got students using these at all levels of education and some students have access to, to free and some have access to to can afford the the paid version is, is kind of the the biggest issue I have in there. So it's kind of dodging your your Congress question, but that's that's the that's the biggest thing that kind of gets at me right now is just to think that that you know this student can afford to have these tools and this student can't, and so we're just kind of increasing that you know gap be, between them for for that. So that's you know I'm really happy to see the um, you know University of Iowa has closed that that gap with Copilot tools being available for for everyone. So that's a step in the right direction, but that's, that's the biggest problem I wrestle with right now related to this. Vicky or Patrick, any safeguards you think would be helpful if the tech companies were to implement? So from my perspective, you know, I think uh, just like uh, the privacy controls and also other like safety controls, I would, uh, uh, like to see, for example, these tools can have some settings like this, you know, checkbox that you can enable, disable, things like that, you know, and uh, because um, you, you you know, when I using, uh, doing some, you know, this general AI, you know, prompt, I always concerned about, you know, whether this content is going to be used or shared with somebody else, right? If they can have this, you know, safeguard kind of control saying that, hey, 
this particular session won't be shared at all. You know, you disable sharing and then you enable sharing, things like that. And then other, you know, like content produce format, you can also give them like what kind of format you, you're going to try to generate. So basically give the users more control on this entire generation process. You know, what kind of input? Am I needing any uh, help on the prompt? You know, things like that. Because there's other new technology out there like auto prompting. You just give a few examples, they're gonna write a prompt for you. You know, so there's all kinds of things out there that you can possibly do. As long as you give the users more this kind of a controls by through the sliders, you know, and to change the whole entire generation process, I feel like, you know, the users are going to feel like they are in power, they are in control of this entire generation process. You know, right now, I don't feel comfortable. I just feel like, you know, everything is basically uh, controlled by the large you know, tech companies. You know, they own everything. And for example, you know, when I try to produce images, I do not want to... Uh, uh, have any copyright, you know, uh, lawsuit down the road, you know, because I'm using this output from these tools, and then down the road I could be sued by these uh, uh, the the uh, copyright owners. Maybe you can have a slider saying, "Hey, do not use any of this copyright materials," you know, blah blah blah, right? So to me, adding those will be something that uh, I would like to see from these uh, online tools. And something that's kind of prominent, like uh, one of those cookie, um, you know, alerts that pops up versus something that's buried in the terms and conditions. Okay. I was Vicky, also what about thinking, you? I was thinking similar lines of Pat. Um, something, you know, Europe has the GDPR. So there, there is precedence of being able to protect our privacy. Um, if you've followed uh, I don't know if you saw, but three weeks ago, LinkedIn set up uh, an option for you to opt out of their AI training, um, but they first scraped their database before they set that up for you. So that was really great to see that. That was three weeks ago in the news. So you have to keep, keep up with all of the changes that are happening um, and to know not only that you can opt out, but you can opt out, you should go do that. So if we were to have this same conversation at Iowa Ideas five years from now, how different do you think the conversation would be? Is there a way to cast that forward? You know, I wonder if in five years we won't be asking for a way to turn it off because AI is becoming so pervasive. It's in every program. It's it's everywhere, it's on your phone. And I wonder if there would be just some way to say, you know, what I'd really like to see is a way to turn it off. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you if you talk about a senior citizens, many of them are really afraid of this AI. And they just, they're gonna say, oh my gosh, what do I do with this thing? How can I turn that off? You know, is there any like a button or switch that I can, can just click on it and then it will stop? instead of causing more trouble, you know, down the road. So uh, having that capability will be ideal, you know, and uh, hopefully we will we'll come to that far. Five years now, our, our digital twins will be attending this meeting for us and we'll just be relaxing somewhere, right? But still, our, we're represented with, with our ideas. So that's, and, and Zoom just announced their digital, right? We're on Zoom here. Their, their digital twins is coming soon and they hope to have them in 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 meeting able to go to meetings for you sometime in the future right so i'm sure that's within 5 years I mean, there's all kinds of discussions about the futures of ai revolution and then there's some debate about uh, you know when we can have the thing called AGI, artificial general intelligence, which means the AI can come to a stage where, as uh, Chris mentioned, like digital twins, they can essentially you know just you know act like a human being, can reason, can learn, can act on their own. When can we come to that far? I mean, if you look at the forecasting, some people says in five years, some people said thirty years. You know, we don't know. But if you look at the pace of this AI development, it's going so fast. You know, if you look at this new AI model developed by OpenAI 4.0, the ChatGPT 4.0, they can really, really uh, reason, you know, very deep level. They can do math problem solving. You know, they can do the formula generation, do the derivations, all that stuff. 
to me, I, it's just fascinating. You know, I, I, and if you think the, you know, about the pace of this evolution, I can imagine that Chris, uh, the things, uh, digital twins mentioned by Chris, probably going to become a reality in five years. So as you guys talk, I can't help but think of the movie um, Wall-E and the um, the way the humans are in that movie. But um, you know, we don't have to think about that. That being the direction of where things will go. So. Um, just kind of looking at Drake and the University of Iowa, um, I I know that, you know, there's probably new um, academic programming that's around AI. I believe the uh, TIPI has a, a couple of new certificates in AI. Is that right? Or is working on developing those, Patrick? Uh, so we are right now in the development of some new programs, uh, like, for example, online MBA, online MSBA program. We are trying to uh, come up with like a two new certificate. This is still in the discussion and the development. We still have to go through the university uh, approval process. Uh, but we are hopeful that by the fall of 2025, we could have like a two new certificate program. One is uh, AI for technology development, technology management. And one is more like, you know, how you can... Uh, build into this AI technologies and learn more about the technical details of this AI revolution. So hopefully these two new certificates are gonna enable these online uh, professional uh, master level students to basically have more knowledge about uh, using AI or managing AI. And Chris, can you tell us what's happening at Drake along these lines? Yeah, so Drake has uh, an artificial intelligence major, which you know we've had for, uh, this is year five, I think, of the artificial intelligence major. So last year was the first group graduated from that. Uh, so we saw this, you know, our president saw this several years ago as a potential way to differentiate ourselves. So we we were able, you know, as a smaller school, we can launch things pretty pretty quickly. So we're able to get that up, up and running. Next semester, uh, the head of Drake's AI department and I will teach the first generative AI undergrad class, right? Which is one of those things where I feel like probably isn't a long-term thing you have. Eventually this gets built into the other things that you, the other classes in a way that you don't need to teach it standalone, but for, for now making it standalone so we can talk about all these, you know, important things students need to know in, in, in this area that may not get talked about in every other class that's doing a little bit of, of AI. And we've been doing a lot of uh, workshops too for uh, students, but more so for just people in the community to let them know we have some expertise in AI and we're, we're uh, teaching it to students, but also to the people who are out there using it in their role, the real world today. So there's uh, have a workshop coming up on Wednesday on just how organizations can implement AI and think about all the steps they need to think about along the way. So that's, a little bit of what's going on at Drake. Very cool. Vicki, last question goes to you. Um, just wanted to ask you about what you advise university faculty about communication with students about the ways that they should and shouldn't use AI in class. Um, I would say it's so important to be very transparent about your use in AI. It will normalize the idea that you know, this AI helped me with my grammar, helped me with my spelling, helped make this faster. And it will also then, you know, give students a model to see when AI is or is not appropriate. And I really do think that that communication about the use of AI will help uh, with the disambiguation, with the ability to see where AI is and how it can be used. Um, because if you are finding it a useful tool, you're not hiding it. You're just sharing with your students, this is a great way to use it. And maybe I didn't use it in this instance. Um, the transparency is, is, the, is the key here. And you had shared when I did, went through my orientation with uh, faculty that some people will use kind of like a, it's like a, a traffic light, you know, with different color coding, like green, yes, it's okay to use here, yellow, use with caution, red, don't use. Those tools probably a lot of people find pretty helpful. 
Yes, uh, that's Leon Furz's AI assessment scale. It, I really love his version one, which is a very color coded. He has a version two that has just come out in the last month that uh, has some more nuance to it. But even that first version is so clear that says, yes, this is totally fine. As Chris said, the objectives are not in, in endemic is are not dependent on AI. We're going to go ahead and use it or we're only going to use it for specifically to help you after you have done your own brainstorming. Now we're going to use it. So we're putting up these these traffic lights or, or safety uh, bumpers on your bowling alley. That's great. Well, that is all the time we have for today. If you want to rewatch this session and others that are part of Iowa Ideas, the recordings will be available online in coming days. Thank you so much to our panelists, Patrick Fan and Vicki Malloy from the University of Iowa and Chris Snyder from Drake University. The closing keynote of Iowa Ideas Conference is coming up in just 10 minutes. It's a talk with Jen Loeb, a mountain climber, photographer, and humanitarian. So please stick around for that. And then after that, have a great weekend. Thanks again to the panelists.